We're moving on from our previous discussion. We're on page 234. And essentially, what Rabbi Yehuda Halevi reflects upon is that so much of Jewish knowledge has deteriorated over the centuries because of the vicissitudes of time and the travails and the travelings of the Jewish people. We dedicate this year today to Avi ben Miriam, who just joined Sahal this morning, and we hope we pray and give him a bracha that Hashem watch over him and keep him safe. Amen. <clears throat> um, so therefore, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi had said that because the Jewish people have been traveling for centuries and have traveled from culture to culture, civilization to civilization, invariably a large percentage of the wisdom that we once possessed has eroded and it's been lost. So one example of that is the beautiful music of the Levium. That no matter what kind, no matter what we can possibly imagine, the music must have sounded like in the Beis Hamikdash. It pales by comparison to what it really was. That was just one example, but probably in art and in sciences and in just general knowledge, the same could be true. And this, of course, leads us to paragraph sixty-six on the bottom of page two thirty-four, which is. Um, probably one of the most powerful arguments of Rabbi Huda Levi, but also one of the most speculative arguments that he presents in the whole Sefer. What I mean by speculative is that he's making a suggestion that we're about to see, that whenever you find wisdom that originates from another culture or another civilization, they really got it from us, and they just didn't give proper attribution. So let's see how he, how he presents this. In, in paragraph 66... The rabbi said, perhaps you can say the same, meaning the same, what we said before, that our, um, our knowledge and our music has deteriorated over time. Perhaps you can say the same about Shlomo's wisdom, that our knowledge today pales by comparison. Blessed with divine inspiration, a masterful intellect, and an inborn disposition, he was able to deal with all areas of knowledge. And this is written explicitly in the scripture. All the nations of the world, from as far as India, came to him to transcribe his wisdom for themselves. Thus, the foundations and fundamentals of all areas of knowledge trace themselves to us. They were passed first to the Chaldeans, then to Persia and Media, then to Greece and then Rome. With the passage of time and multiple transcriptions, it was forgotten that these areas of wisdom originated with the Jews, and they were instead attributed to the Greeks and Romans. Furthermore, what much was lost in translating from Hebrew, because of the inherent superiority of Hebrew as a language, <clears throat> and because of all the information that is contained within it. Now, for today, I'm going to put aside this last sentence about the reason for the erosion having to do with the loss of the Hebrew language. I want to put that aside for today and focus on that next time. But for today, what I'd like to discuss is this very bold claim that any time you find wisdom among the Romans or the Greeks or any other civilization, it really dates back to the Jewish people. Now, where, how does he have a right to make such a claim? How, does he, how, how, can, he, uh, how can he stake such a claim? <coughs> well, the truth is, is that he's basing himself on scripture. Scripture says that in the ancient world, the wisest of all men was Shlomo, and people came from all over the world to extract wisdom from him. And they traveled all over, and they were able to build upon the wisdom that they received from Shlomo's court, whether it had to do with science, physics, astronomy, metaphysics, art, music, and so forth. And he uh, and uh, and they just basically plagiarized over the course of time. It was lost. The attribution got lost, whether deliberately or unintentionally. What about the Jews, the poor Jews, who seem to have only a small percentage of all of that wisdom within our own culture and with our own within our own knowledge base? 
That's due to the erosions of multiple diasporas, multiple persecutions, multiple evictions from one country to another. You lose, you tend to lose your wisdom. You tend to lose your wisdom, and the first kind of wisdom that you lose are the types of wisdom that are least subject to transcription. And so when we talk, the more sophisticated the area of wisdom is, the more easily it is to be forgotten. So when you think about it, um, if the Jewish people had to pick up and leave and move from one place to another, and they could only take sometimes only the things on their backs, and everything had to be retained in their memory, it stands to reason that a lot of areas of wisdom would have, be, would have been lost, at least to the general population. Now, <coughs> I want to point out that, and the, really the objective of our discussion today, is that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is not the only rabbi who is of this opinion. Many people feel that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, because of his Judeocentrism, tends to exaggerate Jewish pride and therefore places so much emphasis on everything comes from Judaism, everything comes from the Torah, and others, like Maimonides, who's a great rationalist and an intellectual, is willing to accept external wisdom and adopt it to the Torah. But upon closer inspection of the Rambam, we will note that he goes even further than Rabbi Yehuda Halevi in staking this claim. As a matter of fact, he writes in the introduction to the Moren of Uchim, the Guide for the Perplexed. This is a work that we've referenced many times. It's almost like a parallel work to the Kuzari in the sense that both of these works, both the Kuzari and the Moren of Uchim, engage with Greek philosophy, engage with the cultural philosophy of its time, but in two very, very different ways. But in this respect, they are very much the same. Just as Rabbi Yehuda Halevi has just s suggested to us that if you find wisdom among the Greeks and the Romans, it's really it really originates with Judaism, the Rambam says this, the very same thing, but even more so. And I'm going to demonstrate this to you. Um, let's see, there it is. In your handout that you should have in front of you, there are four sources, three in Hebrew and one in English. The first stop is a Mishnah. We're not going to go through the entire Mishnah, but the Mishnah states in Masechet Chagiga, we've seen this, I think, maybe last year or two years ago, I sort of lose track of all the years that we've been doing this book. Um, one of the things that the Mishnah says is, Ein Dorshin, that it is not permitted to expound on certain very esoteric topics in a public setting. So the first thing that the Mishnah says, Ein Dorshin, Dorshin Be'arayos Bishloshin. For purposes of modesty, you're not allowed to teach laws that have to do with uh, sexuality in a group of three or more. Then it goes on to esoteric teachings. V'lo b'ma'asei v'reshit b'shnayim, v'lo b'mer kava b'yachim. It is not permitted to teach the act of creation when two people are present, nor is it permitted to teach the act of the chariot when even one person is present. So, what does this mean? What is Mahasei Vereshit and Mahasei Merkava? There are two approaches, at least two approaches, to what Mahasei Vereshit and Mahasei Merkava. Mahasei Vereshit simply means the story of creation. There's a lot of depth in there. There's a lot of mysticism and esotericism contained within that story. And you are limited as far as how you're allowed to expound upon it. You can't go give a public lecture on the deeper secrets of the story of creation. And the first chapter of Ezekiel contains a story of Ezekiel's vision of the chariot, what sometimes is called the Godhead, some kind of manifestation of God in his different facets um, in this chariot, and one that's extremely esoteric and very confusing, and therefore you can't expound upon it even to one student who's not ready to hear it. Okay. So, unless the student that you're teaching it to is already wise and has the capacity to understand it on his own. 
And in, um, in consonance with that, the Mishnah says, Kol HaMistakel Be'arbat Dvarim Ra'un Lo Kilu Lo Bala Olam. Anyone who tries to delve into esoteric matters that are well beyond the human capacity to understand is worthy as if he had never, it would have been better for him never to have come into the world. And the, what the Mishnah is trying to con- communicate to us is that there are certain areas of knowledge that God simply wants hidden from us. The, God, in many ways, is depicted in the Mishnah as the Wizard of Oz, hiding behind that curtain, and he doesn't want that curtain to be pulled away. There are certain things that the human being was programmed to be able to comprehend. And we know, we know for a fact, says the Mishnah, that there are so many things beyond that curtain that we will net that are real, but that we're just simply not meant to investigate further. And so therefore the way that the Mishnah presents it is Malamaila, Malamata, Malafanimu Male Achor. That you're not supposed to investigate what is above, what is below, what is before, and what is after. And so many understand that to mean both in all dimensions of space and time, a person should not try to go beyond the four dimensions of space-time. The four-dimensional reality in which we live is purely a construct. God exists outside of that construct, but the human mind is not capable of understanding the world outside of that construct, and therefore do not try to trespass. Do not try to go outside of it. Now, of course... You know, some may argue that Albert Einstein began that journey to go beyond that construct by coming up with the theory of relativity because it's really mind-bending the way he describes space and time. But according, the Mishnah would argue that he's only scratched the surface. He's only really just begun to understand how really this is all just a construct that we're able to use to our advantage if we understand how it works. But to go beyond where Einstein went to try and really see things as they really are from God's vantage point is, according to the Mishnah, is disrespectful to God, because God is behind the curtain. He doesn't want us to remove, to pull back the curtain. And it's as if, it's as if he's almost challenging his whole right to exist. Because God said, I put you in a world with limited capacity. It doesn't mean that there's not more out there, but it just means that as, as, no matter how hard you push, you're eventually going to hit a brick wall. So try not to be oppositional about this issue. Now, the question is, how do we define Maisa Bereshis and Maisa Merkava? Now, shortly after this story, <coughs> uh, this uh, Mishnah, the Gemara brings a story of four sages, Arba, Shemich, Mesula, Pardes. There were four sages who entered into the Pardes, which literally translates as the orchard. Four entered into the orchard. They were Rabbi Akiva, Ben Azai, Ben Zoma, and Elisha, Ben Abuya. And each one of them was damaged except for Rabbi Akiva. One, one, when they went into this pardes and gazed out into some divine realm. One of them died, one of them went insane, one of them became a heretic, and only Rabbi Akiva emerged unscathed and unharmed. Intact in his faith, intact in his mental capacities, and in his physical health. Now, that story in the Gemara is a continuation, apparently, of the Mishnah. That this entry into the Pardes is a certain kind of speculation about Maisa Bereshis and or Maisa Merkava. At least that's the way that many commentaries understand. And the Gemara is bringing the story as an illustration of how damage can befall a person if they try to go too far in their investigation. The Rambam in Hilchot Yisodei HaTorah, which is at the very beginning of Mishnah Torah, does something that's quite unusual. The first four chapters of the Rambam's halachic codex, his set of laws where he codifies Jewish practice and Jewish law, he devotes the first four chapters to discuss Ma'asei Merkava and Ma'asei Bereshit, in that order. First chapters 1 and 2 are devoted to Ma'asei Merkava, and chapters 3 and 4 are devoted to Ma'asei Bereshit. 
And the Rambam at the end of those four chapters says, you may wonder, why am I discussing this? Of course, this is advanced material that only a very well-versed student of Torah should engage in. But nonetheless, it really does form the foundation of all knowledge because a person has to have at least a modicum of understanding of the reality of the universe that God created in order to really proceed properly into a study of Torah. Because once a person understands that there is a concept called creation, and there is a concept called ma'asemer kava, that there are certain rules of physics and metaphysics, of the way that the world works, he can proceed and understand that the Torah's laws were given to function within that world that is constrained by four dimensions. Now here's something fascinating. When the Rambam defines ma'asei merkava and ma'asei bereshit, he does so in terms of Aristotelian philosophy. Basically, he says, uh, if you want to understand ma'asei merkava, you need to understand the metaphysics of Aristotle. And therefore, the first two chapters of Hilchot Yisodei HaTorah talks about the way that God exists as defined by Aristotle, as a prime cause, <coughs> as an entity that emanates from itself all of creation through a, through a series of emanations that are spherical and emanate further and further away from God until we get the world that we find. <coughs> he also talks about angels in the, in the, in the second chapter and basically describes Maasei Merkava in terms of Greek philosophy. He does the same thing with Maasei Bereshit. He defines that there are four elements. That's what Maasei Bereshit is all about. And that when God created the world, he caused emanations of physical matter to emanate from heaven. And the way that he describes it is based on the science of his time, based on a book that Aristotle wrote called Physics. Now, of course, this is very... Um, controversial what the Rambam has done is because it's as if I started to write a textbook on Judaism and in the first opening chapters of the textbook, instead of talking about the Chumash and uh, the Tanakh and Torah Shaba al and the Gemara and all of the other works of our sages, I started with an explanation of, of the Big Bang Theory and uh, why we believe in God based upon scientific proofs, and so forth and so on. So this is what the Rambam has set out to do. Now, one of the criticisms of the Rambam is that he over-invested in Greek philosophy, because whereas the rest of his Mishnah Torah is based on absolute truths of Torah Shaba al the first four chapters are not axiomatic because they're not based upon any concrete text that we can point to in the words of our sages that talk about uh, Aristotelian philosophy in the way that the Rambam does. So how does the Rambam defend his feeling that this is part of Mishneh Torah, that this is part of Torah knowledge? He does so a little bit in the Moreh Nebuchim in several places, but there's one passage in the Moren Nebuchim that I'd like to read with you. And as I've stated many times before, the Moren Nebuchim was written in Arabic, so there's no benefit in us reading it in Hebrew, <coughs> which would just be a translation. So let's read it from an English translation from the Arabic. It's in source number four in the handout. He says, Know that many branches of science relating to the correct solution of these problems, what problems is he referring to? Philosophical dilemmas of how God interacts with our universe, were once cultivated by our forefathers, but were, in the course of time, neglected, especially in consequence of the tyranny which barbarous nations exercised over us. Does that sound familiar so far? So far, so good? Besides, speculative studies were not open to all men, as we have already stated. Only the subjects taught in the scriptures were accessible to all. Second reason why they've been lost to us is not only because of various iterations of persecution, but also because in every generation only a select few people 
were deemed knowledgeable enough and sophisticated enough to engage in Maase Bereshit and Maase Merkava. And so therefore, you know, it's not the everyman. It's almost like that kind of thing where, you know, hey, Rabbi, do you study Maase Bereshit and Maase Merkava? If I tell you, I have to kill you. It's like it's on one of those kinds of areas of knowledge that no one's allowed to know about. And the rest of the, the, rest of the general populace is engaged in regular Torah study. This is the esoteric Torah. And therefore, over the course of centuries, many people lost it because they had never received it as part of their tradition of what Torah is. And he says, even the traditional law, as you are well aware, was not originally committed to writing in conformity with the rule to which our nation generally adhered. He wasn't even permitted to write down the Talmud and the Mishnah. Based on the teaching with reference to the law, this rule was very opportune. I'm sorry, the things which I have communicated to you orally, you must not communicate to others in writing. The Talmud says that I don't, God says, I don't want Torah Shabbat al Peh to be written down in, in books. I want them to be communicated orally so that people will have a tradition that goes from person to person so that there's no room for ambiguity. And that's another reason why so many of the esoteric teachings, which were never committed to writing in the first place, have been lost to the sands of time. With reference to the law, this rule was very opportune, for while it remained in force, it averted the evils which happened subsequently, namely great diversity of opinion, doubts as to the meaning of written words, slips of the pen, dissensions among the people, formation of new sects, and confused notions about, about practical subjects. The benefits of not writing down Torah Shabbat al Peh are that they avoid all of the problems that the Rambam has just detailed. When everyone is communicating directly with each other, then there's far less room for mistaken interpretation. So, oh, so it says, no cooking on Shabbos. So if I say that to you, you understand, I, I mean to say, no cooking on Shabbos. But if it's written in a book, you could read it as, no, cooking on Shabbos. <laughs> right? That's just one, that's like one simplistic way of explaining it. So that's an example of what the Rambam says. When something is in writing, it's more subject to misinterpretation. And that's the reason why our sages didn't want things to be uh, uh, transmitted in, in text. They wanted them to be transmitted orally. The traditional teaching was, in fact, according to the words of the law, entrusted to the great tribunal, as we have already stated in our works on the Talmud. Care having been taken for the sake of obviating injurious influences that the oral law should not be recorded in a form accessible to all, it was but natural that no portion of the secrets of the law, Sisrei Torah is what we call it, that the, meta, the esoteric or the metaphysical aspects of Torah teachings would be permitted to be written down or divulged for the use of all men. These secrets, as has been explained, were orally communicated by a few able men to others who were equally distinguished. Hence, the principle applied by our teachers the secrets of the law can only be entrusted to him who is a counselor, a cunning artificer, etc. The natural effect of this practice was that our nation lost the knowledge of these important disciplines. Nothing but a few remarks and allusions are to be found in the Talmud and the Midrashim, like a few kernels enveloped in such a quantity of husk that the reader is generally occupied with the husk and forgets that it encloses a kernel. So there is much that is embedded about our esoteric tradition within the Talmud and the Mishnah, but unless you're looking for it, you're going to easily, very easily miss it. Then the Rambam goes on, continuing in this chapter, with the discussion of Greek philosophy. And his point is very simple, is that all of the areas of esoteric Torah knowledge are what is contained within Greek philosophy, are contained within the philosophy of today, of my day, says the Rambam, which is Aristotelian studies that are perpetuated by the Greek, um, the Islamic philosophers of my time. Yes? But the Rambam incorporated all these things as truth and science. And those are the Torah. That's right. Subsequently, as a lot of Aristotle's theories are debunked, that delegitimizes what he said about other things as well. Doesn't it give so much credence to like, Aristotle? And in turn, that's, an excellent, that's an excellent point, and we have to be very careful about that. You see, that's how I, I, I think I just started to mention that idea. One of the criticisms of the Rambam is that he over-invested in Aristotle. So that over the course of the centuries, when Aristotle 
really starting around the 15th or 16th centuries, which is relatively recent when you think about it, when Aristotle began with the Renaissance, began to start, to start being debunked and to be disproven and that science was not based on Arist Aristotelian axioms, it sort of puts a little bit of egg on Rambam's face. Because if he says that these are areas of wisdom that we always possessed, it's because he believed them to be absolute truths. So how do we defend the Rambam against that? Our defense of the Rambam, if the Rambam were alive today and we would have put him on the chair, shine the spotlight on him and say, Maimonides, how do you account for the fact that Aristotelian, Aristotle has been disproven in so many areas of physics and metaphysics that you had put, put, put forth as being axiomatic truths? that were originally contained in our oral tradition. So I think that the Rambam would answer as follows. Number one, you have to appreciate that he writes in the Morna Vuchim itself that not everything that Aristotle wrote is true. There are a lot of things that Aristotle got wrong. He himself admits to that. He has to because Aristotle believed in things that were heretical to our belief in God. And there, really what the Rambam did is that he tried as much as he could to reconcile what he perceived to be truth within this philosophy and reconcile it with Torah. But when he found certain things that were irreconcilable, he pointed those out as well. But he assumed that the other things were absolute truths. He assumed that they were. So he would say, well, they were, they were axiomatic truths in my day. I'm willing to make those adjustments to the mission Torah. Give me a big eraser. And we'll just erase those parts, and I'll write the theory of relativity in chapter 4 of Hilchas Yisodei HaTorah. Well, that's a danger, this whole approach of saying that these are really part of our tradition, because that's the assumption that... It, it is dangerous. It is the danger. But I think that the overarching idea here is that when we find truth about the world, about science, about anything that's true, then we should, un we should assume that it came originally from us. A lot of the scientific discoveries are based on research and a new approach to science. That's right. It's now, I, to do with the Torah tradition. Right. <laughs> it's, it's relatively it doesn't, limited. right. And, and so therefore, it doesn't necessarily mean that Shlomo HaMelech knew about the theory of relativity the way that we know about it today, but he probably was aware of something that was connected in some way to the theory of relativity or to quantum physics. Um, he knew a lot of stuff, so therefore it stands to reason that this was there was a tradition. It got corrupted over time. The Rambam thought, perhaps mistakenly so, that the Greek philosophers had sort of captured some of that corrupt tradition that we lost. And if he were here, and he would say, well, I guess they weren't. Now, I would also add one other thing. The other thing that I would add is that even though so much of Aristotle has been disproven, but a lot of it has to do with our orientation and the way that we view the world. The, Aristotle talks about metaphysics in the first two chapters, uh, in, in his book on metaphysics. And there he talks about the interaction of the divine realm with the physical realm. We know that a lot of the things um, having to do with physics are wrong, based on our observations and our instrumentation that tells us that they are wrong. Um, but we don't necessarily know that everything that Aristotle said about the metaphysics of the universe is incorrect. <coughs> there could be aspects of the metaphysics that are correct also. And I'll, I'll even go further. When Aristotle talked about the four elements, earth, wind, fire, and water, um, and we classify now that how many elements are there on the periodic table? I keep losing count. The changes, they get, they get, every year they're, they, they've been adding more. 200, something, something, something like 200 different elements. It doesn't necessarily mean that this is a contradiction to Aristotle. It simply means that it's using a different lexicon, a more sophisticated way of classifying the, the different things that exist in our universe on their most elemental form, whereas Aristotle was talking about some kind of perhaps morphological chemistry instead of uh, physical chemistry, perhaps. But anyway, you're right. Your point is 100% uh, valid that the danger of what the, the exercise that the Rambam engaged in was to, was to accept as absolute truth that which science of his day says is true. And we would do well to be duly cautioned from the mistakes that the Rambam made. So even though we can put a man on the moon based upon our understanding of quantum physics, 
Um, but that may only be a one way of representing a much larger construct that is, can be described in a totally different way. We still don't understand our universe completely. We, still, we don't have an account for all the dark matter that allegedly exists that we haven't been able to account for. The universe seems to be held together by something that we can't even identify. So scientists are still puzzled by what's going on. They're also puzzled by coming up with a, what they call a theory of everything. We don't understand how to reconcile uh, particle physics or quantum physics with the theory of relativity. We still don't understand how to do that. The two seem totally incompatible. And people are working and talking and discussing string theory and multiverses and everything like that. But these are all just theories. We still don't, we still don't get it. Would it be inappropriate for a rabbi of today to say that this is the way we understand the universe today? Probably it wouldn't be inappropriate as long as he qualified it by saying, of course this is all subject to change when Hashem chooses to reveal to us by whatever scientist he chooses that things are different from the way that we thought in the 21st century. Fair, fair enough? Okay, good. Okay, <clears throat> so my objective was to try and demonstrate that point, that Rabbi Yehuda Levi is not alone in being very uh, prideful about Jewish knowledge. Jewish knowledge encompasses everything. Why, when it comes down to us in my age of, you know, the, the 12th century, do I find that it has a much more narrow application to just Jewish practice and the way we live our lives? That's not because of the limitations of Torah knowledge, but rather because of the vicissitudes of time, the, the tiltulim, the various iterations of suffering and persecution and diaspora, and that's the reason why that's all we have. But there was much, much more. And it should not, therefore, therefore not be surprising that when we talk about the Hebrew language, which is going to be our next discussion, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is going to suggest the very same thing. He's going to tell us that compared to Arabic, anyone here speak Arabic? A little shwaya, 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 kalila. Okay. Umtes. If you speak, if you understand Arabic, you know that it is a much, much thicker dictionary than the Hebrew dictionary. The Arabic dictionary has hundreds of thousands of words. The Hebrew dictionary has hundreds, maybe thousands of words, but it's much, much smaller in its vocabulary. This was another criticism, that if you are truly the most sophisticated people, then why is your language so inferior to Arabic, the spoken language of the time and of the philosophers and of the Muslim world? And that is something that we'll approach using the same approach that Rabbi Levi used for this. We'll approach that next time.